There's a marketing campaign for Southwest Airlines that you probably all know of. It goes by the slogan, want to get away. Now, I'm sure over the past couple of weeks that there have been thousands of people going to the ticket counters of Southwest saying, I just want to get away, you know, and I can't get away. The slogan was made popular off of TV ads. One of my favorites uh, dealt with a man who's dressed in a business suit. He's a younger guy, and he's standing in front of a bank. He's on a cell phone. He's hailing an Uber driver. And as soon as he hangs up the phone, a black car comes screeching in with tinted windows and stops right in front of him. And he says to himself, boy, that was fast. Opens the back door, jumps in the back seat of the car, and begins to give the driver instructions. The driver's looking at him frantically in the rearview mirror and looking ahead, you know, like this. And all of a sudden, both of the back doors open up. Two guys dressed in black with mask on take their positions with our man hailing the Uber driver in the middle. They've got a duffel bag. It's a black duffel bag. They throw it in his lap, and they open it right in front of them. And as soon as they open it, the dye in the bag, the explosive dye, goes off, blue. <laughs> Covers him in blue paint. Comes back to the slogan, want to get away. In Mark 7, 24, Jesus is experiencing one of those want-to-get-away moments. He's been in Galilee conducting his ministry amidst opposition from the Pharisees, from the scribes, from the teachers of the law. The main challenge of the religious elite dealt with the issue of law and legalism. You see, they believed that their keeping of the law and their legalistic lifestyle would be the means by which they earn eternal life. And you can probably hear the problems in the way that I'm saying it. Legalism deals with man's attempt to use the law as a means to gain eternal life and to justify oneself. Ironically, Legalism is still alive today. You'll hear the legalistic heart say things like this. You, fill in the blank, owe me. You owe me. A lot of times, their prayers will look like that toward God. God, you owe me something. Legalism has all the appearances of holiness, but it lacks the power to save. It focuses on a type of piety, but it's a type of piety devoid of grace. The legalistic heart elevates its theology and its system as being superior to all other theologies, superior to all other systems. The legalist looks at everyone else and says, well, the way you read the Bible is just cursory or just wrong. Friends, legalism is a trap that never satisfies. If you find yourself saying, I'm right and everybody else is wrong, I'd recommend look in the mirror again. Until Christ comes back or until we die, there's always the potential that we are not perfect. Now that rule goes for every theologian, every preacher, every missionary, and every Christian. You see, grace is totally different than legalism. And it produces a different ethic. Grace creates piety, right living. But it's never a self-justifying piety. As Jesus goes from Galilee, Gennesaret, Mark 6, 53, to the region of Tyre and Sidon, Mark 7, 24, the change of location also indicates a change in the primary audience. You see, Jesus up to this point has been focusing on a Jewish crowd. And their distinctive challenge was, first of all, legalism and the lack of the ability to see Christ in the Old Testament. The woman that Jesus will encounter in a primarily Gentile region is radically different than the scribes and Pharisees and their traditions of men. 
She is a woman who is born apart from law. She's a woman who is distant from legalism. She knows nothing of it. She's a woman who depends completely on the grace of God and not on her ability to earn favor with Jesus. Now, I typically give you the point. I'll do that again. Jesus has come to be the answer to human need. He has not come to validate our human status. Now, we're going to divide our text up into four movements. They're not equal parts. I won't spend equal time on them. I'm going to give you two S's and two R's. First of all, Mark's going to paint a picture of the setting. That's the first S, verse 24. Then he'll tell us about the situation. That's the second S, verses 25 and 26. Third, we'll look at Jesus' response in the form of a parable, verses 27 through 29. And then fourth and finally, verse 30, we'll look at the resolution. Two S's, two R's. Let's read Mark 7, 24. As we look at the setting. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. Jesus has traveled from Galilee to Tyre in the northwest. Tyre is Gentile territory. It is basically in modern-day Lebanon. Now, to say that Jews and the people of Tyre didn't get along is a massive understatement. Josephus, the Jewish historian of the first century, writes this about Jewish and Tyre relationship. Josephus said that the people of Tyre are notoriously our most bitter enemies. They personified, people of Tyre that is, one of the most intense forms of paganism in the ancient world. Now there were extra biblical Jewish texts, not, not included in the, in the Bible, that pictures the Messiah raising up and marching with an army against the Gentiles of Tyre and annihilating them. For Jesus to visit this region, and this type of people would fly in the face of all Jewish sentimentalities. The Messiah has come to save outsiders. He has not come to save those who believe that they're on the inside and they need no help from God. Now at the end of verse 24, Jesus enters a home intending to remain hidden. Now, what we know about Jesus is no matter where he goes, there's one thing that's true about him. He can't remain hidden. If people love Jesus. This woman will as well. Your first S was setting the second S situation, verses 25 through 26. Again, read along with me. But immediately, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him. And came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrio-Phoenician by birth. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her child. Verse 25, Mark describes a desperate woman who has a beloved little daughter who's afflicted by an unclean spirit. Now, she might be a pagan, she definitely is that. But she knows that Jesus is compassionate and kind. If anyone can help her daughter, Jesus can. Often unbelievers understand something similar about Christians. They don't know everything about our doctrines and our theologies. But they do know Christians of all people on the face of the earth, they care. If believers can help in desperate situations... We usually help. There's one great difference between Jesus and his legalistic Jewish opponents. One among many. The legalists are so worried about their religious appearance that they don't humble themselves enough 
to truly care about others in need. Now, I've found over the years that many of those that claim to have the most pristine theology also care very little for missions. And I don't think that's an accident. I wouldn't blame it on their theology. I'd blame it on something different. I blame it on their legalism and their desire not to be inconvenienced. Can't tell you how many pastors I've talked with and invited. Come, let's go on a mission trip. You're going to work harder in these next seven days than you work probably all year. And the response is, yeah, I, I, I just really don't want to do that. Don't want to go. And I ask, well, why? Well, I mean, it would just mess up my whole week. You know, got everything planned out. If I sign up to go with you, week's blown. They'd rather go to conferences. They'd rather listen to their own little speakers, tell them everything that they believe anyway, instead of being inconvenienced for the sake of the gospel. Now, Jesus, we know, is not like that at all. He cares. And he doesn't mind being inconvenienced to help the lost, to help the hurting. Jesus' compassion for this woman is similar to an Old Testament story. You can read about it in 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 9 through 24. Elijah hears of a woman from Sidon, similar place, Tyre and Sidon. And he goes out of his way to help this woman. Now, it's also interesting to me that Jesus' ministry among the Gentiles is a little bit different than his ministry among the Jews. You see, when Jesus is among the Jews, and especially his disciples, his primary focus is teaching, teaching, teaching. He explains who he is by opening up the Old Testament to them and saying, see, I'm right there, and there, and there. I'm all over this. But among the Gentiles, Jesus will do mighty works like exorcisms, healings. He'll feed large groups of people. Those works prove that he's God and that he has come to save. Now, much like Jairus in Mark 5.22, this woman comes to Jesus and she immediately falls at his feet. Her concern for her child overruled all cultural differences between Jews and Gentiles. In the words of J.C. Ryle, she saw a beloved child possessed by an unclean spirit. She saw her in a condition in which no teaching could reach the mind. No medicine could heal the body. A condition only one degree better than death itself. Jesus, we find in the Gospels, is continually kind toward women, and especially widows. Now, it's not until verse 26 that we learn the full background of this desperate woman at the feet of Jesus. She is a Greek, she's a Gentile, and she's from Syrian Phoenicia. To most Jews, she would have been enemy number one. Don't go around people like that. They would have probably asked Jesus, what are you doing? How can you allow her to be in your presence? But there she is at his feet asking and asking, and asking. This little woman's daughter is a prodigal. She's afflicted by an entity that has gained power over her. No human cure is enough to change this girl's situation. The constant asking of the mother reminds me of persistent prayer. This little girl had a praying mother. And where there's a praying mother... There always seems to be hope. Now, friends, we don't have to look very far in our own families or even in our church family to find prodigals for whom we should pray without ceasing. 
The problem might be substances, drugs or alcohol or something else that's just gained a grip on an individual's life. It might be addictions of other kind or, or just a wayward heart that rejects the living God. In all of these situations, we find ourselves powerless. Nevertheless, prayer connects us to the one that can break any rebel heart and rescue from any evil situation. You see, God commands us to pray not because we are powerful, but because God is powerful and because he has elected that our prayers be one of his means to change others. Jesus responds to the woman's petition by giving her a parable in verses 27 through 29. Your first sorrow, Jesus' response. Read with me. And he said to her, Let the little children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She answered him, Yes, Lord. Even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. He said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. Jesus' parable points out the distinction between children and dogs. Now, I know it's kind of obscure, but the children that he's referring to here, this would have been Israelites. The dogs would be everybody else, or we could give a different label to it, Gentiles. In the ancient world, dogs were not typically the household pets that we all love today. When you hear the word dog, you need to kind of transport yourself into the third world. Think about the dogs that you've seen in the third world, eating whatever they can find on the street, typically dead animals and other things like that, scavenging around. And this is why in the ancient world of the first century, Jews would call Gentiles unclean dogs. Now, there's a bit more subtlety in this word play than we might find at first glance. The term for dog that Jesus uses is not the typical street dog term. He uses instead a diminutive form that we would translate lap dog. Lap dog. Do you know they had lap dogs in the ancient world? Lap dogs in the ancient world were found in the home, not outside of the house. Now, I've got two little lap dogs, and sometimes they're adorable. Sometimes they drive me crazy. But what's true about them is, anytime you eat dinner, where do you find your lap dog? Under the table, right? Looking to help clean up. Now, it was a lot worse when the kids were babies, you know? <laughs> if you're going through that phase of life right now with little kids, you know, when a little child eats in a high chair, you know, food goes everywhere. And that lap dog is happy, so happy to be under the table. Jesus is telling this woman that she has a place in God's kingdom as well. But there's a salvation historical order to God's call. In God's economy, salvation came to the Jews first, then the Gentiles. Romans 1.16, Paul says, for I am ashamed, or for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, now hear this, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. In the scheme of salvation history, that's what we find. When Christ comes, we'll call it the Christ event, when he's born into this world, when he dies on a cross, when he resurrects and ascends unto glory, after that event, it's no longer Jew first than Gentile. Jesus destroys that dividing wall of hostility. Now, God treats all men, Jew and Gentile, the exact same. Now, the overall point of the parable is to draw out faith. 
Jesus is teasing faith out of this woman. He does this for her good, for God's glory. God often does the same thing in our lives. He allows us to go through desperate and difficult situations that stretch us, that make us uncomfortable, that deplete all of our human resources. And when we have nothing left, then he saves us. Then he gives us grace. Now the woman's reply in verse 28 demonstrates that all she has in this life is Jesus. Jesus is her only hope. Let's look at verse 28 again. She answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. You know, it's incredible. This is a very short parable, but this is also a very unique parable. You see, for the first time in Mark's gospel, Jesus has given a parable, and the recipient of that parable understands it completely. And she sees herself in that parable, and her response is based on the parable that Jesus gives. Now, the disciples, when they hear parables, they hardly ever get it. Jesus will take them aside, and he'll say, okay, now, I said this, and they'll go, yeah? What I meant is this, and they'll go, okay. And then they'll ask, did you understand that? And they'll go, yeah? No? They don't understand? Instead of being offended by the term dog, she accepts it. She claims it. But she says, Lord, there's enough for both. You can, you can help Israel. But you can also help me. Jesus is able to give both the children and the dogs all they want to eat. Now that verb, eat until one is satisfied in verse 28, it's already been used in Mark's gospel. When Jesus fed 5,000 primarily Jews, Mark chapter 6, verse 42, we read, they all ate until they were satisfied. Now guess what? The same verb, kortadzo, in Greek, will be used again in Mark 8, verses 1 through 10. Jesus will be feeding a Gentile audience of over 4,000, and we're going to learn the same thing. They all ate until they're satisfied. You see, in the history of salvation, Israel has a privilege, but it is not a privilege in exclusion of the nations. Verse 29, the woman met Jesus within the parable. She saw herself there. She recognized her need for God's grace. And Jesus' response in verse 29 tells her that her pleas have been heard. Her daughter has been healed. Friends, persistent prayer is powerful. Persistent prayer is effective. James writes in James 5.16, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. My question for you, have you prayed for yourself lately? You see, the legalistic heart prays prayers like this. God, change them! Oh, the, you know, change them all! But it doesn't look here. God, change me. Work on me. I'm not done yet. I know that. God, work on me. How's your prayer life? Maybe there are needs or perhaps individuals that You've been praying for him for a while, and you've decided, ah, uh, there's just no hope there. Done praying. Friends, don't give up on him. Don't give up. Maybe you feel like your prayers are going up in the air and bouncing off the ceiling. I would tell you, 
God hears. God knows. God cares. The same God that teaches us how to pray also commands you, pray. He listens. He's not aloof. He cares. Now, I told you I would give you two R's. The last R is the resolution to the story. Verse 30. Read along with me. And she went home and found the child lying in bed. The demon had gone. Jesus has given her a parable. She saw herself in it. She responded from within that parable. And she trusts Jesus. She goes home. When she gets home, she finds this child that was beyond all hope, beyond all cure, in her right mind, saved. The demon had left by the command of Christ. Now, friends, this woman is the exact opposite of the religious elite who depend on their ability, their performance, their list-making. She's not like that at all. She doesn't create a list and then say, well, if you'll just do my list, you can be in too. I found a secret. It's called my list. No. She said, I found a secret. It's called my God. It's called my Christ. She thrust herself at the feet of Jesus and found a Savior who's the answer to any and all human need. Friends, Jesus didn't come to validate status or position among men and women. He came to save us from our sin. The question I want to leave you with this morning is, do you realize your need for him? Christians need Jesus. Non-believers need Jesus. Please stand. Let's sing.